call this meeting of the North Reading School Committee to session at 6.33 p.m. <clears throat> in accordance with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, signed by Governor Baker on June 16, 2021, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Laws, Chapter 30A. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted with some remote participation. While in-person attendance per, of members of the public will be permitted, and a quorum of the school committee will be in person, this meeting is concurrently being presented through a Google Meet and or by a live broadcast by NORCAM to allow the public and any school committee, school committee members who cannot attend to participate. I'll state for the record that Mrs. Imbriano is not here tonight. So we have four members of the school committee and our superintendent and assistant superintendent Connolly here. So welcome everybody. <clears throat> we begin as always with any public input. So if anybody here has something they would like to address to the school committee that is not on the agenda tonight, because we always give you a chance if you want to comment on something that's on the agenda to talk at that time. Anybody has anything they'd like to speak about, please raise your hand or unmute. Okay, hearing none, <clears throat> we move on to the student report. I believe we have a new student here, uh, Cassandra Fitz. I see you on here, so if you'd like to unmute and give your report, we would love to hear it. Okay, hi. Um, so I've just compiled like some things that have been going on in the school lately. So for academics, the end of term one was Friday, November 5th. And so term two is starting up this week. Senior MCAS for the Abigail Adams Scholarship for State Schools is coming up, and as well as testing for the seal of biliteracy. Um, for the arts, the Masters Performance of Newsies is coming up in December, and the North Reading Marching Band will be performing at the Veterans Day ceremony on Thursday. Uh, for athletics, winter sports registration is opening soon. Uh, Teams that have recently ended their seasons are girls soccer, field hockey, and volleyball. And the cheer team won the Cape Ann League Championship. Uh, the football team is playing a home game against Norton on November 12th at 6 o'clock. Boys soccer will be playing an away game against Newburyport on November 10th at 5.30. Fall sports awards are tomorrow night, and banquets will be within the next few weeks. Uh, currently, there's some fundraisers going on. I know a couple different grades are selling lanyards, I believe. Um, the Interact Club is starting their leaf raking project in which they volunteer to help rake leaves for senior citizens. Uh, the DECA Club has the competition coming up on November 9th. And the Senior Civic Action Project is moving into stage three and the timeline's been redesigned so it'll be completed within the last two months of school as opposed to like earlier as it normally would be. That's all I have. Oh, good job. Any, any questions from the committee or anybody else? Rich? Uh, so welcome, Cassandra. Uh, you're a, a sophomore this year, is that right? Yes. So uh, how, how has the experience been for you back in school? I, I know you got a little bit of back in, in school at the end of last year. How has it been this year um, uh, for your first full year of actually being here? It's been feeling a lot more like normal the way it was in the past. There's still some things that are different. Obviously, we have to social distance, wear masks, etc. But it, it just, it's been a good experience so far, and it's getting us closer and closer to the way we used to be to, to normalcy yeah thanks interesting uh cassandra i have a couple quick questions for you the first one might be negative but i know i know I, you mentioned boys soccer is playing again so that means they won same with football did girls soccer lose their playoff game yes okay and then <clears throat> since you run to be on this to be the school committee rep i'm just curious are there, is there any specific reason you wanted to run? Any, anything specific that you would like from your experience as, as your student rep, to be the student rep? Um, I joined because I'm really interested in like political science and stuff like that. And I think this is a good experience to see that sort of stuff on a smaller scale and just to be involved in the community also. Great, and I would just say, just so that you understand, your student report is in the beginning you are welcome to leave after that. You're welcome to stay as well. So if there are things on the agenda that you see, 
you know, in, in advance, you, if you want to look at the agenda, if there's ever anything that you want to be heard on, if you can let Dr. Daly know in advance, I'd be happy to, you know, try to put that higher on the agenda because we would love to hear your, your voice on things. So if there is something that you want to be heard on, if you make sure to let us know, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, try to move things up if we can, just to, so that you can have your voice heard on things if, if you're interested. Okay. Well, welcome. If there's no other questions, <clears throat> we'll move on. And again, as I said, you're welcome to stay as long as you want, or if you want to jump off, that's fine as well. Okay, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> okay, we have no continued business. So there is no high school proposal for tonight? That item is tabled. I do have uh, a late add to the agenda, if we could just take a moment to recognize a professional status teacher. Um, of course. So, uh, Ms. Tracy Nicholas is a nurse in our district as an educator, and she is someone that we uh, granted professional status to this year. As you know, I brought those folks forward. Just wanted to take a moment to thank them and to recognize them. And um, at your suggestion, we have added an additional little um, thank you prize. It's a small token of appreciation, but it's a very nice little pin that um, Tracy, I left it for you on your desk. I didn't get it to you before uh, you left, but it's just a, uh, you know, to commemorate the commitment um, that you've made to us for the past three years and that, that we have with you moving forward. And so if, if my memory serves me, the first real interaction I had with Tracy was on our, our um, you know, our world famous bus trip that we do with our new staff every year. And we were driving around, Tracy knows the story, and one of our new staff members wasn't feeling well on the bus. And Tracy instantly went into action, was providing services on the, uh, the very first day on the job during the orientation. And I just, we had a great impression. And I just have to say, you know, I've, I've got to know our nurses a, a lot better in the past year and a half. And, um, you know, everything that, that they have done has been fantastic. I think Tracy does it all on a, on a large scale, right? Every time you have to trace classes at the high school, it's just, so many more classes, so many more variables, and she's just um, put in so much time and effort even above and beyond her regular work day in these past years. So I wanted to take a moment to thank her, that we're very, very happy to have her with us, and um, she's added so much to our district, and we're very excited to, to have this relationship of professional status moving forward. So thank you, Tracy. Excellent, and, and what, what school are you at, Tracy? I'm at North Reading High School. At the high school. Well, welcome. Congratulations on being here for three years. And I can't imagine a tougher job for the nurses it, it, being a nurse in the last couple of years. So thank you so much for all the work you've been doing. And I don't know, I mean, it, we, it, you, you missed a very awkward one when we didn't have anything to give you. So at least we have a pin now, but <laughs> <coughs> we, we, we very much appreciate the, you know, the commitment that you're giving to us. And hopefully you know, you'll be here for many years to come. Thank you, right. and thank Thanks, you, Dr. Tracy. Daly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Tracy will now give the COVID-19 update. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's the transition. COVID-19 yeah. update. Thank you so much, Tracy. So, thank you, thank Tracy. you, Tracy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You can sign off if you don't want to listen to the COVID-19 update. You probably talked about COVID enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dr. Daly. Great. So thank you so much. I just actually what was I'm just curious was was there a specific club that's going to be coming up and what club was that do you know there is it there is a proposal for a culinary club um, so typically the clubs are proposed in the spring of each year and um, the principal does have the discretion to propose a club mid-year and I think due to all the circumstances last spring uh, Mr. Lepret considered that there were just some um, steps that needed to be taken to identify the advisor um, but this did come from students, so it's a. We do have a proposal. It looks it looks great, um, and it's going to be on the agenda for next month. There was just some some hangups with getting everything together for tonight. Thank you. I'm just cu a curious guy. Yeah. <laughs> great. So the um, you know the most the major updates I want to share. Uh, obviously, I, I think this is our first meeting since the mask mandate has been extended through January 15th. And I just want to be clear on a couple of things that I've been receiving a lot of emails about um, in relation to the, the mask mandate also with vaccinations and vax, quote unquote, vax mandates. 
As I've said many times here, there is no indication that there's any kind of uh, mandate around a vaccine. The only information that I've ever heard from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is that if there were to be a, ma a mandate, it would be coming from the Department of Public Health, not from the Department of Education. So that's, that's the only information that I've really heard about that. We are um, continuing to get uh, additional information from our staff um, to consider the 80% thresholds. We have all of our schools uh, staff is currently above 80%. Um, so this was not, we did not uh, mandate that everyone showed us their cards or not. We, it was all voluntary. So there may be some room here for people that just chose not to share. They may be vaccinated. Um, and there may be some folks who just, um, for whatever reason, didn't, didn't bring in their cards. Uh, so they, the numbers could be a little bit higher, but everyone's above 80%. Um, Batch Elder School is 91%, Hood at 87.5, Little is at 98%, Middle School 81%, High School 84.96, so 85. Uh, district is at 92%. And so, to be clear, that's staff? That's teachers? staff. That's Those are, that's staff, staff. Yep. And so we're still in the process of looking <laughs> at, at student numbers, but, um, but we know that we would not be at that 80% um, number for everyone. Um, because the middle school and high school are combined. So the, at the moment, those are the, you know, the, we are offering vaccination opportunities. As you're aware, the, the youngest students now have the opportunity, the clinics that we've been offering. Um, there were many people who wanted to have their children vaccinated right away, and they were able to get slots pre-registered. So when the vaccination was approved, we were able to get in. So there was a good number of people who, who pre-registered for those, and we've shared those out. Um, but again, that's just uh, an option, and, and it's something that's available for those that want to participate. Um, the, the vaccination, I'm sorry, the, the mask mandate was extended. Um, the reasoning that was cited for that was mostly around a few different things. It was the, the ability to have the, um, the two holidays, the holiday seasons, basically, with travel and, and gatherings included. Um, and also to give time for the students who had not yet been vaccinated to be vaccinated. So I, I've been sharing with people that have written that they're, they're hoping that this will end soon. My hope is that this last extension, logically, I could see this being, um, you know, maybe the last, the last time that they need to extend this. I'm not sure what they will do. Obviously, they'll look at the data at that time and see what's, what's happening. But I do understand that at this point, um, not everyone has had the opportunity to be vaccinated if they wanted to be vaccinated, and this would extend that um, opportunity now and, and have that window from the early November approval through the January 15th. So at that time, the Department of Ed keeps speaking of additional off-ramps off that are not connected to vaccination, and so my hope would be that they could return possibly at that time to um, you know, a similar recommendation to what we had in the summer, which was, you know, leading back to uh, choice. So again, more to come on that. There's not any more information at this time, but they did um, extend it for a couple of months there. And I have heard, as I mentioned, from several people about both vaccinations and, and mask wearing. And so that's the consistent answer I've been giving to everyone. Um, and I just wanted to share that here. We have extended our, our testing program support. So we've had um, Beth Steele, who has been our nurse that's been working on this program, um, is now officially the program coordinator. We've been able to hire a few other uh, folks. I put out a, a survey to gather information from parents and we had, uh, from the community, parents and community. We had several, uh, about 40 people put in that they were interested in helping us out, which was great. Um, I passed those names on. We've hired two individuals. Um, there are some other individuals that we're able to bring on, so we're going to be able to expand that program, which can make it more efficient, get uh, the staff and students in and out faster, and we're able to expand from middle school, high school to two days a week to get even more people participating. Um, you know, the, the time that they were able, the students especially, was during their lunch and power block, and we found that some students were not quite... Um, you know, we, we're suspecting that possibly that time wasn't ideal because, you know, that's the only time they might have with their friends and it's a short time anyway. 
Um, so we've extended it to have a little bit of time before school and also do it on two different days so that we could try to, um, to get more people that are interested to participate. So we still continue to have those options available along with symptomatic testing, test and stay. And all of the staff that we're able to get in that is working under this third party uh, company um, takes some of the burden off our nurses who are working so hard with their regular positions to have to do all this additional testing is a lot. And so to have this additional support has been very, um, very well received by, by everyone. And, and the fact that some of our own people are able to now, um, you know, work under this heading of this other company and to train, the fact that they're people that we know and trust that we've worked with already and been successful with is very exciting. So we're, we're looking forward to that um, continuing to be another support that we have in place. <coughs> So those are the two major updates. I don't know if there's any questions or Michael, if you had anything to add about COVID updates at this time or? No, I think that, um, I think you kind of covered everything. I think operationally, I think things are sort of flowing in terms of, you know, the food service program. I think the numbers are, are doing really well. So I'll talk a little bit about that later this evening. Participation has been, has been good with the, with the free meals, breakfast and lunch. Um, the busing program has, is, is rolling well. We, we did start, last week we did start the late busing program as was one of the initiatives we felt we could do with the combined um start and end times and that's we did we did start that last week and i think that went fairly well so we're hoping to continue to monitor that and maybe expand that and open that up to more more students as the um you know school year progresses and um you know overall i think you know operationally things are flowing pretty well I'll, I'll have a COVID funding update with the budget update later as well. Questions from the committee? I'll have a few comments and questions quick. Um, the uh, one thing I just want to state because there's been a couple of parents or other community members that have emailed in. Just to clarify for the record again, I mean, right now there's that the mandate for mask overall, but even if that were not there, the underlying message was 80% vaccination status or um, uh, yeah have 80 percent vaccinated and none of our buildings are at 80 percent just want to make sure that that's you know on the record there um in terms of numbers though if i if i'm correct in all of october there are only five positives for students and five for staff is that correct correct that's significantly lower than we were seeing last year right it is well <clears throat> at that time last year but definitely um <laughs> even lower than in september right yeah. so it was just a um a definite that. drop and, and so then, far even better this month so yeah and and with the with the late bus michael i mean how, how many how many students signed up for the late bus i'm just curious so there was about 65 students that ex were are participating in the um the extra help after school the homework club that were interested in the late bus um I would say there hasn't been that many that have that rode last week. Mm -hmm. So out of that 65, it was maybe 10 or 15 percent actually then got on the bus, um, or others got picked up and so forth. So we're you know we're hoping that you know changes and there's the ridership goes up a little bit. But if that's not the case, we'll be able to open it up to to more families that may be interested. And I know I know my son is doing. The, the drama club and I know that that stays later than the late bus was and so mm -hmm. I mean do, do do most things end by to be able to do the four o'clock bus is that, is that most that, that's the thing I've talked to to Dr. O'Connell about that as well and so we're going to see whether we need to adjust the bus or adjust the clubs or you know um, certainly the idea that this is something that we've wanted to do for years and just the ability to have students who couldn't participate because of transportation being able to participate is huge. So certainly we'll try to um, adjust those times on either end if we can, so. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I would just add to that, that my old, my old thought about a late bus always has been, I don't know what the numbers are gonna be, but it's not so much about the quantity as about the quality. So if you are mm -hmm. providing opportunities for a dozen kids to, to participate that weren't able to otherwise, that to me is a victory, even if it doesn't feel like a lot of ridership. So. Yeah. That's great. I want to thank Mr. Connolly for working so hard on that to make that a reality because it's been something that back when I was an assistant principal, I used to beg for. So yeah. it's like it's it's great that we have that just to bring you up to speed on the numbers. So the the peak 
that we had, you know, January, just for student numbers, 44 in December, 40 in January, 28 in February, 25 March, 34 April. Then it started dropping off. It was back to 22 in September, down to five in October, and zero so far in November, which is great. So yeah. certainly trending in the right direction, which we're very happy about. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I love the idea of the late bus because I, mean, I was thinking of clubs, but I forgot about even like extra help after school. And it's not even just the clubs, it's even kids that need yep. help after school. So, yep. mm -hmm. great. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Moving on, a capital improvement plan. I know we talked about this before, sure, and I see there's some adjustments okay. to it. So, Mr. Connolly, if you want to walk us through. Sure, I, um, I'm going to attempt to <clears throat> share my screen. this viewing can you see this yep okay so um yeah in the packet this evening there was a, a memo so i think we kind of provided a detailed presentation um at the last meeting um in terms of our large capital projects over a three and five year time frame um there was a lot of good discussion and feedback i felt like the administration received and um dr daly and the administrative team went back and we tried to at the next administrative team meeting you know talk a lot about the feedback and um, I think a lot of it made sense in terms of looking at the numbers and how we can maybe accelerate some of the, the requests that we are, had originally proposed at the, at the October 18th meeting, um, as well as looking at some additional, you know, funding that may be there through COVID and, and, and different things that the town will be also have available this year that they'll be reviewing and I'm assuming that will also become part of this process as well as just looking at some of the challenges that we're now facing with transportation and it's getting better, but there's still a level of uncertainty. We, we kind of re-looked at the schedule. I wouldn't say we added a lot of um, projects to this, but we more or less looked at the calendar and the schedule over the three or five years and just made some adjustments, um, which you'll see um, reflected here on, um, on the pages. So I'm gonna kind of move through on, onto the, the recommended priority list. So the one change I'll just highlight is the priority number one. This was originally a $67,500 request that we were initially asking to do over two years. Um, as a phase in approach, this is the elementary smart boards replacement, interactive devices replacement. Um, so we certainly heard the, the fact that you know, we were only asking, originally asking for about two hundred and $65,000 in year one and year two because of some other large facility capital projects was still a very high request. <laughs> we felt like we could maybe accelerate this replacement. I think, I think there actually some, it could be some economies of scale at doing this all together. I talked to Dr. Downs who would manage this purchase and we, we managed it this year. And this would essentially accelerate um, this by a year and it would get the, all the boards potentially replaced by the start of um, September of 2022 20, or fiscal 23 as opposed to fiscal 24, um, which, would, which is a positive thing as well. So and I think it's, there is some efficiency gain, some economies of scale gain to just kind of do all this at once over one summer as opposed to trying to spread it out over two. So that, that's, and that was a, um, a discussion point at the last meeting and we kind of heard that and are now recommending that change. Um, items number two and three are the same. Previously, I think these are important projects from a ventilation standpoint, from a quality of service standpoint, from an energy efficiency standpoint. I think we should, these should be high up on the priority list and we need to move forward with these requests. And items number four and five, I'll just say they're not necessarily new requests, but we've kind of accelerated their importance and moved them up. Um, this item number four, had, this has really been on the list for quite a number of years, it's been deferred. Um, but there's certainly a need to start looking at these electronic systems at the elementary schools. So that includes the, 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 the clock system, the intercom system. Um, they're old when there are issues. Some of the equipment is so old, it's hard to even find a company that is able to service them and troubleshoot it. Um, you know, some of these, it's hard to find replacement parts for some of these um, issues. So it's, when something goes down, a wiring issue, a paging issue, it's, it's just hard to, to find it. It takes, it takes a while. Um, so we'd like to 
focus first on that that request. I think that's inherently a principle. That's the most urgent need is to synchronize the clock system, bring in a wireless clock system that would be fully synchronized, easy to manage. When we have a situation like Sunday and there's a um, turn back the clock situation, you know, we're not running to 62 different clocks in a building and manually adjusting those because some of the clocks have broken and we're, we've moved to a battery battery clock system to get those functioning. So there's not, we're not in a situation where there's all the clocks in the classrooms read a different time. So I think we've come to try to address this. We've gotten proposals and this would address that and it would also address sort of a centralized paging system by adding sort of a, a module in the, in the principal's office that should make that whole system easier. So it, it's um, about $15,000 per school. So that would be the top priority. That was originally like a couple years out and we just kind of kept deferring it. And then the fifth one that we've added, this was originally in the second year, um, but certainly listening to some of the challenges with special education transportation, um, we feel like we could accelerate the request of replacing the 2011 van. Um, and by doing this next year, if funded, it actually would provide us the option of actually incorporating a fourth van into our fleet. So we think the 2011 van could potentially last another year or two as a reliable spare. So if we didn't replace the 2011 van at that time, if funded, and um, we could, we could uh, take the new van and put it into the operation and start doing some out-of-district transportation, um, which could lead to some savings and just be more of a reliable service because right now there's just a, this has been a challenging few months. It is getting better, um, but we feel like we had to do some of it anyway this year for the first time. So we've already kind of had to adjust and, and did uh, do some out of district. So we felt like if we could get a reliable driver and some spares and op, we could do some out of district transportation and save, save some money as well. Um, and you know we we're also trying to balance the you know how big of a fleet can we want to manage before we have to add personnel and in a many dispatch office but we feel like we could certainly manage four four vans and four drivers and potentially save and do some of the out of district so this option provides us to that and i think in t speaking to the cipc you know they love looking at payback periods i think this would be a very quick payback period probably two years um, as uh, this could be a, have a payback period. So, so we've accelerated that, that program, or that, that option. And then in fiscal, so the total request is $425,000. So it's still not a huge request, but it's more than the 265 that we originally had proposed. And then that makes um, year two, that makes really the chief focus there being the hood school roof restoration, which is we know is a high ticket item. And then it would be phase two of the electronic systems. So that would access, um, address the access control system into the building and, and it would address some, some of the intrusion alarm systems that just need, need repair um, in some areas um, for similar type issues, just old wiring and just an old, an old system that's difficult to troubleshoot. And we have gotten proposals for that as well. So those would be the focus in fiscal 24, should everything get funded? Now if anything doesn't get funded, we'd have to redo this next year and, and make some changes. But then in fiscal 25, which would be year three, again, we submit three years to the CIPC. It essentially stayed the same that you saw last week. The only change I think is, is that we accelerate, I think the, the electronic system phase one was in this year, so we've accelerated that and did it in year, year one and year two. And the only other change is we, right after the meeting, or really the evening of the meeting, we were getting updated quotes for the Wi-Fi. So I think I had 95,000 there and it just, we need a little bit more funding to do that. So it's about, I changed that to 130,000. Everything else stayed the same from last meeting. So um, again, in, pri in the priority list, you know, they ask us to submit it, um, to, to prioritize and submit. So this was um, the administration's effort to look at, you know, what is the most important, um, always what's gonna have the biggest educational impact on the students. Technology is always a, a priority. Um, as well as just safety and, and just certainly, you know, in this era of ventilation and improvements in HVAC systems and so forth is important. And then the safety with electronic systems is, is, is always a focus. So 
it's you know student educational impact and student safety and staff safety and community safety is is what's looked at as when we when we try to prioritize these 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 items so with that i'll open it up to any questions so again we the timeline th these would be our due on friday mm -hmm. so we are looking for kind of an endorsement approval this evening so i can submit the um capital sheets and programs to the cipc by the deadline well thank thank you very much much mr Connolly. <laughs> it seems like when we hire staff we got to ask about if they can drive a bus for us yeah right and for us because <laughs> be nice to have a few staff members um I have no questions or comments or I think it's I like all the changes. I think they all make sense. Other comments, questions, committee? I had a question. Um, looking ahead to next year or looking ahead to the hood roof project. Um, if you in your notes, it mentions that it the, the roof is still is an excellent candidate for restoration that would extend its life for 20 years, which is great. Is there danger? Is there is that a, like a fine line where we're in danger if it gets pushed back obviously i'm still we're still looking at next year anyway but mm -hmm. if it gets pushed back too much that we get past that point where we we can't yeah i think are we close to that or is it still would we have some wiggle room there a couple of years? it's definitely i would say it's the conditions de deteriorated over the last couple of years in particular we we've had to you know address certain areas of the roof we did yeah. do an infrared scan um through our insurance company we worked with uh through maya and we we had a company come out and, and perform a program and um we did identify some areas that you certainly need attention and we've tried to do that um so we we've, we've certainly are spending more money each yeah. year yeah. on repairs and leaks so i think the danger is it's going to be more more costly and more money um and right now based on the assessment that's only a couple years old they felt like it was was a candidate and i think at the more time we're probably not in if it goes outside two or three years we're probably closer to that and yeah. where it needs a full full replacement but um you know i think i think where you know this is sort of the right window over the next couple of years we yep. need to address it we've deferred it a couple of times <clears throat> um, because it's in that 20 you know over 20 25 years life you know we could consider what we did with the little school roof that's certainly going to add um, overhead cost to it um, but it's going to also bring a lot more expertise into the project a lot more checks and balances a lot more designers and project managers looking at it and trying to define the right solution um, which isn't a bad thing um, and then it should bring about 48 to 50 percent reimbursement we'll probably get back to the same number with the yep. overhead I think we kind of learned that with yep. with the little school project so okay thanks mm -hmm. Any other questions? Chris, Diana? Okay. If somebody wants to read the page and make a motion for us. Sure. I move that the school committee vote to approve the large capital improvement projects in the priority, present, uh, priority order presented by the administration to the capital improvement planning committee for fiscal year 23, 24, and 25. I second. Okay. Since we're all here, well, most all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. We're all in person. Aye. Opposed? So it passes four to zero. Great. Thank you. Mr. Connolly. Thank you very much. Making record time here. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm back, I took the reins from Mr. McGowan. <laughs> We're moving quick. I just want to so. say I did I did not get us back in time for the first pitch of that game, but I did get us back in time for the only important moment, which was the two grand slams. So <laughs> I just wanted to true. review that. That's true. <clears throat> okay, we don't have uh, Mrs. Imbriano, so someone's going to have to step up tonight and uh, do the minutes motion for October 18th open oh, session. I can stop sharing, right? Uh, Looking at Diana and Chris here. I'm glad I'm getting to it. I just want to, I'm looking for the phrasing of it so I can phrase it correctly. I move, I move that we to approve the minutes for the open session on October 18th, 2021. I second. Okay. And for comments, any, anybody notice any changes? Mm -mm. I actually did read them because I knew Janine wasn't going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I saw nothing. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes four to zero. <clears throat> Budget update, Back Mr. Connolly. Yes. So in your packet this evening was the budget update, which reflects financial activity through the end of October. Um, and the budget continues to be in 
in solid standing. Um, like I said, we had a very um, solid close of fiscal year 21. That's certainly because of a lot of COVID funding and, and grant funding and additional federal sources. And um, we were able to really set ourselves up in, in good standing um, to deal with sort of the unex unexpected in fiscal 22. And you know things have been um, progressing well. We, we certainly were able to to um, exceed what we had budgeted and forecasted for our special education prepayment amounts. So even though we've had some additional costs come up, which isn't unusual in the, in the area of special education for um, some out of district uh, you know, placements and costs in transportation in some areas, um, as well as in just some repairs that we've needed in certain areas for boilers and HVAC equipment. Nothing super out of the ordinary, but we've, we've had, had some needs that have come up in the first quarter and a month of the fiscal year. We've been able to address those without, without major concern, and we're, we're, in, we're in good financial standing. The special revenue accounts are, are, are healthy and solvent and in good standing, and there's been no surprises with, with the cash flow of revenue coming in in terms of what we've anticipated. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, the food service program um, has been doing very well. There's been strong participation, over 50% on a daily basis. So with the um, USDA you know, federal subsidy that we've been receiving with the free mails, um, it's been, we've, we really have a, a, a good amount of revenue flowing into the program, um, which, is, which is excellent. So that, that account is in, is in solid financial standing. And you know, I think really at this point in the year, we're just gonna certainly monitor um, the heating season and the utility costs and certainly certainly areas that need to be addressed but I think we're in we're in good financial standing there's really no major um, surprises um, from the last update at this point um, but what I did want to talk a little bit about I think I said you know really this might be a good time to just take a quick look at where things stand with our federal additional COVID-19 federal funding sources so on the last page of the report beyond the expense and salaries. I did, um, similar to what we did last year, I did kind of just update. These are some additional grants that we've received through the really federal grants that are COVID related that are all helping us do certain things this year, um, you know, to address the, the learning loss and you know, the social and emotional needs and, and, and so forth and the need to um, to really address you know, learning in certain areas. So um, Dr. Daly worked really well and we had a Summer Acceleration Academy grant this year. And this, this was really a summer grant, so it's, the deadline's expired and it's been fully spent, but this was an additional allotment that was really helpful um, this past summer. Um, the ESSA II and the ESSA III funding, so just as a reminder, this was all spoken about during the budgetary process. We knew this funding was available to us. We knew we, we know we have the next three fiscal years to spend it. So we want to spend ESSA two first before you spend ESSA three. So even though we had to kind of do the grant applications and then indicate where we want to spend it, um, we do have a few years to spend it. So right now we're, we're working with ESSA two and that as a reminder is funding the school adjustment counselors, the some digital learning technicians, um, some intervention tutors. Um, and then we do have, we know of SR3 and we're gonna look to um, continue to, to fund these positions that were added, which is mainly the, the actually the school nurse as well, the, the digital learning technicians, the intervention tutors and the adjustment counselors. So the plan was to spend about 215 or so thousand over the next three years and that's so to sort of avoid that funding cliff and continue to reassess each year um, as we get closer to the end of this, this funding. But we know we have through fiscal 24. Um, and then these two additional sources were um, part of the American Rescue Plan, you know, federal funding source. They're, they're sort of, we receive a good amount of special education funding through the IDA grant as well as through the early childhood grant. So these are like two additional funding sources through um, federal funding sources through sort of COVID-19 uh, um, monies that are available um, and Cynthia Conant, Director of Student Services is uh, working at um, you know, spending these funds, but it's essentially for um, additional allotments for kind of that medical therapeutic contractual services for eligible students, special education students in need. And then 
a grant to purchase some assistive technology for again eligible special education students that are in need. So similarly as how we spend these funds for IDA and 262, which is two additional allotments that allows us to have that additional flexibility for us to do more and, and, um, and it's needed too because there's a lot more services and a lot more compensatory services that are coming up every day and um, that are needed that are being identified. So certainly helpful, but as you can see, we're about $856,000 of additional grants that we're receiving. Um, most, some of which had need to be spent this year, but the biggest thing is that we have the SR3, which we have two more years to, to spend. So with that, I'll open up to any questions on the budget. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Questions? Chris, no? No, I'm good. Rich? Nope. Diana? I'm good. Nope. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. I mean, I would just point out that in the budget process, we were able, you know, with the work with the select board, we were able to extend a lot of those funds and not have to use them this year. So it is nice that not only do we have the ability to spend them for a couple of years in our planning process last year, that's exactly what we plan to do is spread them out over three years, which will hopefully allow us to keep some of these positions a little bit longer. So just to add that yeah, there are a couple of grants that we've put in for in the last week or so right. too. There's yeah. one for, uh, we're, we're exploring one to look at MTSS for our district. There's another one about financial literacy for all students, grades K to 12, uh, for some explicit lessons about um, financial literacy, which is a part of the history frameworks and just how to implement that. And there's another grant about reimbursement for um, some of these summer programs. Um, we may be able to um, access some, some additional reimbursements for either local funds or even some of the uh, grant funding that came from some of the federal funds, if it if appropriate. So, um, is all of those grants are sort of uh, sorry. No, sorry. I did put in for a food service grant as well. Food service, similar to what we got last year, is kind of an equipment grant. So, but yeah, there's so there seems to there's just a lot of grants that come out. You yeah. got to kind of turn it around very quickly. So you know, Mr. Connolly, Mr. Clean, Ms. Uh, Conant, Dr. Downs is also putting in another grant around digital literacy. So there's just a lot of uh, funding opportunities. A lot of these are certainly, you know, rank ordered by districts' needs, um, accountability status. You know, where where we are very low ranking, as far as consideration. However, um, we're still taking the time to put them in, 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 for the chance that we get some funding back, and uh, you know, we're hope we're hopeful that we will get some additional support. So, just wanted to add that as well. well and, and 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 I appreciate the work from the administration in doing that. I mean, I don't. It doesn't go unnoted that. <laughs> You know, there there are a lot of funds out there and I think some districts don't take the time to do it and I know that it is a lot of time on top of your other job so I appreciate Mr. Connolly, Dr. Daly, the other administrators who do take the time to apply for them because as we know every every dollar that we are allocated is used for something and so yep. you know I think the community should understand that we don't turn back money we, we use the money that we're allocated for whatever we can so it's great that we can, you know, we're limited in what we can get every year. The town can only increase two and a half percent every year. We have a limited resource, so it's great that we can extend that when we can. So thank you guys. Have we ever talked about a grant writer position? Select so, board wants one. Yeah, so we've talked oh, about that's it. Right. That's where I'm for Yeah, <clears throat> it's, um, it's something we've thought about for different things um, in town. And it is it is coming up at the at the town side. So there's certainly could be some supports. We do have some, um, we have looked at that through a cost share measure with Seam Collaborative as well. Right. And so we do have someone there that helps us with Title III and with some other grants as well. But um, yeah, these are these are the competitive, these are the DESI grants that, you know, you know, it's worth putting in for, but again, it's it's like when you look at, and that, that's what you find with a lot of the grants we don't, we don't qualify for, right. um, which is kind of challenging. So when we've, gone down that road of saying is it worth in-house to bring someone in uh, we haven't we haven't explored that fully yeah it doesn't it, it full-time doesn't seem like it's yeah, yeah. I, can, I can see that but maybe if the town is exploring that too it might yeah. be some sharing thing that, yeah that's been a part of our conversation I mean we're, we're fortunate in this town and that we do have a lot of support from the community and you know I everybody understands we have a high tax base but you know it does support our schools quite a bit we don't have as much business as some of the other towns around here, as we all know, which makes it challenging. And, you know, we have a, you know, as you said, we, 
our, our district performs pretty well, which means we are, are un, ineligible for some other grants. So if we do the best we can and a lot falls on the community, but we very much appreciate the community support. So thank you everyone. <coughs> okay, staffing update? Uh, none at this time. Bids and donations, none at this time. <coughs> none at this time. Subcommittee update, finance planning team. Mr. McGowan, you wanna update? Finance planning team met on uh, the 29th and we started looking ahead to uh, the revenue pl plan and um, I think we spent a lot of time talking about uh, looking at changing the way we're looking at um, budget. Uh, budget looking at doing a th what a five three or five year look back and then projecting forward a little bit. Um, rather than just dealing it as, as much year to year. And I, I mean, I would, I would jump in, sorry to interrupt here, but yeah. I, think, I think one of the challenges, what we always see is we wanna be conservative in our estimates for revenue, but what that leads to is a large amount of free cash at the end of the year, right. because everything is not actually budgeted. But the only way we're able to support our budget every year is by using the free cash from the year before. Right. And so I think the goal this year is to maybe not budget it so that so much money flows through to free cash to try to budget a higher revenue amount a more realistic revenue amount and part of that is looking back three to five years to figure out what the actual revenues were in the past right. to budget for the future and then maybe over a year or two adjust it so that we're not we're not using so much free cash each year and we have a more accurate number because the idea would be if there's really num if there's really money at the end that's flowing through rather than you know, using last year's free cash to pay for this year, I think a lot of it would be, let's budget it more accurately. So I think that was what we yep. we, we talked a little bit about. Um, and, and none of this is about cutting budgets or changing budgets, just being more accurate and, and, and putting it on, right in the front the yeah. burner. Of the room. Well, and, and, and there's things that I don't completely understand with about like, you know, how our town's bond rating is, is, is figured out, is determined and you know, some of these accounting practices, if you aren't using your free cash, it looks better to bond for bond rating. And so again, I think it was a, a good discussion. Um, I think there's a lot more to come, but I don't think anything, that, none of this is, as Rich said, none of this is to adjust what's happening. We're not trying to use free cash for things that we weren't, you know, planning on doing before. We're not trying to cut things. It's really just trying to make sure we're doing it in the proper accounting way. Yep. The only other thing that I remember was we <clears throat> talked a little bit also about, like, like we were just talking about with the grant, <coughs> there is a lot of state money out there and our local reps, you know, um, Senator Tarr and Representative Jones are, you know, they've, they've been very good about advocating for our town. And so I think the finance planning team is talking and I know Mr. Connolly and Dr. Daly and uh, Mr. Gilberto and um, Liz, what's Liz. and Liz. Forget us. <laughs> um, are are talking about trying to get together the list of needs that we have in town, both on the municipal side and the school side, just to see if there is money that comes up, if there's some funding that, you know, any grants that we could get, any projects that we could get, because there's a lot of federal and state grants and money that might be out there. So just like we were just looking at the capital improvement project, some of those projects are going to be on you know, kind of our wish list. We just want to make sure we have an open dialogue with our with our representatives, so that if there, you know, are if there are some funding sources that become available, that they are very aligned with what our needs are. And so, and and, and on that, I, I know that Dr. Daly and Mr. Connolly were working to put some of the some of the things from our capital improvement, but also potentially some of our uh, our NRPS 2025 mm -hmm. request onto that list. Have we been able to do that yet? Or is, working on, is that a work we're on progress? Still, we're still working on that, yeah. Okay. But yeah, that, that kind of came up and just trying to make sure that we're all aligned with the needs that we have mm -hmm. and, you know, working with our state representatives to advocate for us if we can. Yep. Fine Arts Subcommittee? Uh, yeah, Rich and I uh, both Kind of attended that one. <laughs> um, we, we were both, unfortunately, um, having to do it from um, virtually. But uh, it was a good meeting. It was it was kind of like a getting back into the into the the school year groove meeting, and it was an interesting time of year for them. They uh, 
uh, as I hope some of you guys uh, were able to attend, the, um, the Haunted Playground had just concluded a, a couple of days before. Um, so that was kind of a one big arts-based event that they had just finished. And, uh, and the rest of the meeting was spent really discussing mm -hmm. upcoming events, none of which are immediately, up I, the, the, I guess the, the play is coming up. Newsies is coming up in December. Yeah. Three weeks, four weeks, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's the, the, the most proximate thing. Everything else is a little bit further out. So it was really just discussing long-term long -term events coming up. A little conversation about the holiday concerts, too, and what the yeah. plans are for those. So. Yep. Are they going to be more back to what they were before? Or? I think we're getting close to it, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. we'll have in, it'll be, you know, masks for the audience, but there will be an audience in person. And they, uh, yep. we're hoping for the performers to be able to unmask as needed um, if they're spaced out and far enough away. So I think we're going to have something that's going to resemble, um, you know, a typical year. I think the schools, the individual schools are making decisions around concerts and that's based on venue, based on um, a lot of different pieces, but there will be some winter concerts this year in, in various states. So we, we talked it all out. We, we had some decisions and each school made the best decision for their school. I, I will I will jump in on the fine arts on, on a couple quick things. Number one, I thought the Haunted Playground was excellent. I did bring my kids. I made a large donation to the games. I am still, still think if I get two of those three bottles, I should have gotten the prize. And so <laughs> I had to be two in a row to get the prize, but it is what it is. Um, but on the, <clears throat> on the concerts, or uh, just thinking about concerts, I know last year we didn't have band in the elementary schools. And I know that at least at the little school, and I'm curious if this happened at the Hood and the Batch, but I know that Mr. Tatro announced at the little school, he has a higher, present, a higher participation rate in the band than he's ever had in like 19 years of teaching there. 70% of the fourth and fifth graders are, are playing an instrument in the band this year. And I think a lot of that probably is, I would suspect that fourth grade usually has a high participation and then it dwindles down a little bit. But I thought that was excellent to see 70%. Do we know at the, at the hood and the batch if they saw high participation rates as well this year? You know? I think it's been high. I know that they were having some issues with the instruments as well and some backwarded instruments and things. So we've we made some adjustments there. Um, and there, were, there was some uh, band participation at, at the schools last year towards the end. They did some concerts in the spring. It was a little bit, it was just like everything else, just very different. But I don't know if the fourth graders started last year. I don't think, like, at the little school, they didn't start the fourth graders. They didn't have an option to start. Maybe the up. The fifth grade. The did. fifth graders were doing it, but they weren't starting with the new ones. Yeah. At least at the little school, this is the first year because my son's in fifth grade. Gotcha. The it's two, the first two year years. that he was offered it. Um, and I know that, again, if it is, I know Mr. Tatra is doing an awful lot because with with that many kids, there's a lot of extra times and it's it's a lot of work. But I, I think it's a great program and it's great to hear that so many students are trying a, trying an instrument. So. It is. Yep. It's very exciting. And so get, yeah, getting around to see the kids practicing and, and it's really it's really exciting and they're able to do it you know they still have you know, masks and they're doing things but they're spread out using different spaces i saw them in the cafeteria at the bachelor school mr muse and um you know the clarinet was what i got to observe the other day and it's great they're really it's just good to see that in and they're they're very thankful to not be outside chasing their music as it's blowing down the hill <laughs> like they were last year so um so far so good with that yeah I don't, know, I don't know how smart it was that my, my son, who's the shortest in the class, decided to do the trombone because he can't reach <laughs> half the positions, but <laughs> he will eventually be able to hit all the positions. Um, subcommittee, any other subcommittee updates? So Schedule's coming up. Finance planning team is December 3rd at 8.15 a.m. Fine arts is December 8th at 3.15. Athletics is at December 15th at 12 p.m. Any administrative report, Dr. Daly? Uh, ju I just want to share a couple of items. It, one thing that um, has been really great for our culture, uh, Cynthia Conant, Director of Student Services, has framed this month as a gratitude month. And it's just something that I, I think is really neat is the staff are sort of emailing each other, writing notes to each other, just taking time to thank one another and to recognize things. And it, it's amazing. I, I have received a couple. <laughs> and uh, it, does, it, it makes your day. It really does, just for people to take time out of their day to do something like that. And I just thought that was just a great uh, way to frame the month. I, one thing I had included in my opening day this year was just about the research behind gratitude and how 
you know, taking the time to recognize what's positive in your life just can change your outlook on the day, on the year, and frame everything that way. And so it's, it's really great to, uh, to see that as well. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah. Right, the only comment I'll add is uh, that you talked about Mrs. Conant um, from subcommittees. I, I attended the CPAC. The, uh, they had a great. presentation a couple weeks ago and Mrs. Conant presented. She brought, it was an introduction to all the staff and student services. So it was just an open meeting where, you know, they sort of talked about, you know, the general ways that it work, like who the liaison is and how that system works and introduced everybody that's on her team and, you know, answered questions at the end. And I thought it was a nice way to sort of bridge that gap to the parents that were there. And I thought it went really well. So I appreciate her having, and, and all everybody on the staff taking the time to come to that meeting. And yep. I thought that went really well. She's going to give us an update a little bit on student services next month as well, or next meeting as well. Excellent. Right. <clears throat> Any correspondence to talk I, about? I just wanted to share, I forgot to bring it down with me, but uh, the Haunted Playground, all the students who work with us and presented to us gave us a really great, um, they gave me and the school committee just a great thank you uh, for, the, for the support of the program this year. I thought it was just really well. And it's, it's sort of that last step sort of in their whole process of who do I need to speak to? Who do I need to present to? Who do I, you know, and then having the event, it's successful, and then a thank you. It's just really uh, great civic action that, that that group took. So I wanted to share that with you. We're really, I was not able to attend. My children were very disappointed. We had a, a death in the family and had to attend a, an event outside of state. Um, so I had the kids, couldn't bring them, but I'm glad to hear you folks were able to attend and had a great time. I feel like the committee should be writing them a thank you letter. I know. <laughs> that was great. It was a great event. So sorry for your loss, Dr. Dilling. Okay. Future business, November 29th, we have a, a meeting at 6.30 p.m. And as Dr. Daly just said, student services is going to present. December 6th, we also have a meeting. And then January 10th, we have a meeting. All at 6.30 p.m., all here and on Zoom. If there's nothing else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. Oh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes four to zero. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>